I never would have guessed that the complexities of the marriage problem would be a computer science topic, <laughs> or that uh, John would be, uh, his talents would be suitable for solving that. It's great here. Uh, hi, my name is Jeff Huang. I'm a faculty member in computer science. I've been here almost four years. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Carlson, who did his bachelor's in mathematics from the University of Connecticut in 1977 and then came to Brown to do a PhD. So he's one of our alumni. He did his PhD in only three and a half years because from what he's told me, uh, John was planning to go to Paris right after. So he uh, <laughs> quickened his pace. And he's John's first PhD student and also the second PhD student ever from the department. And after his PhD, he went to teach at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and then went on. And since then, he's been at the, uh, uh, he's been a research staff scientist at the uh, Com Center of Computing Sciences in Maryland. So uh, he's going to be giving a really intriguing talk titled Time, Space, and Memories. Thanks, everyone. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, so I was uh, one of John's PhD students. And yes, I did graduate in just a little over three years, somehow. Uh, I consider myself very lucky to have that had happened. So uh, here we are, time, space, and memory. So I'm going to, uh, uh, there's, the re there will be a little bit of research content here, but it'll be more like uh, Tom's talk from earlier. So let's move on. Uh, so when I came, I came to Brown in 1977, and uh, well, I took uh, back then, as Tom mentioned, there was there was a program in computer science in, ex in existence, and John's office was in this building, uh, Barris and Holly here, uh, and well, so John had just published his book, and so in the fall of two. Uh, in the fall of 1977, I took CS 277, The Complexity of Computing. Uh, and wow, this was just uh, amazing. It was like drinking out of a fire hose, okay? And uh, I'll relate one story along the lines here. So John gives the class, the, I, I forget how many, it wasn't a large class, it was maybe 10 or 15 students. And uh, he gives us our midterm uh, sometime in October. And so I go home, and you know, you, when you get a midterm, it's a take-home midterm. You have a few days to come up with your solutions. You're on your own. And so I come in and I turn in my solutions. And the next, the next lecture, he proudly announces that the last problem on the midterm was an actual research problem, and he didn't expect any of us to actually come up with a solution to it. <laughs> but he was hopeful. <laughs> so um, yeah. That's, I'll try and get a few more stories in here too. Okay, so uh, uh, actually I was not John's first PhD student. I was actually his fourth, okay? And um, his first PhD student was, uh, whoops, wrong button, sorry. I don't want to give away my talk here. Uh, Chuck Fiducia. His thesis was on the algebraic complexity of matrix multiplication. And Chuck, uh, proved some interesting upper and lower bounds on uh, computing uh, matrix products. And uh, unfortunately, Chuck is no longer with us. Uh, if he was, I'm sure he'd be here today. Uh, and then there was a, a, a fellow, Ed Lamagna, the complexity of monotone functions. This was more in the lines of what uh, uh, Larry just discussed, looking at particular functions. Uh, I don't know if if you, you probably may not know what a monotone function is. It's a function that's strictly increasing. Uh, and uh, Ed studied and proved uh, lower bounds for these monotone functions. And then Sumichi Swami, uh, his thesis was titled on space-time trade-offs. And then I came into being, okay? So, um, uh, and then I'll go back even further, okay? So this was actually, I did a little homework here coming up with this, and I discovered that this was the title of John's PhD thesis from MIT. And so uh, a couple of people have mentioned the, the, the greats, and in, well, they've mentioned Claude Shannon, one of the great uh, uh, 
founders of, the, of coding theory and information theory who did so much seminal work in this area. Uh, so uh, John was, uh, John was uh, well, Claude was a reader of John's thesis. Here's the title, Computational Problem with Sequential Decoding. And I did a little more homework, and I think, I, do I have this right, that your thesis advisor was actually Erwin Jacobs? who now is, uh, he was one of the founders of Qualcomm and is actually a, a quite a rich man, okay? <laughs> okay, so that's an interesting story there. John's early days, right? Before Brown, actually, okay? Uh, so now I'll go back to some of my early days. Well, so as Jeff mentioned, uh, I got my undergraduate degree from the University of Connecticut uh, back in 1977. And I was actually a, uh, I was a mathematics major but I also, uh, I mean, I took a lot of computer courses. I probably could have majored in, in computer, or computer engineering or electrical engineering or computer science, whatever it was called then, if I really counted up the number of courses that I took. Uh, so I'll mention a few things here, okay? Whoops, I keep pressing the wrong button. Uh, so here we are, here's an IBM 360, here's a picture. So we had one of these at the University of Connecticut and I actually, you know, some of my, uh, some of the courses I took required programming this beast, okay? And so, what was involved? Well, what was involved was you would, you would, uh, you would write your program in the form of a deck of punched cards. And, and then you would go into the computer room and feed your punched cards. I think that's actually the punch card reader right there. And then you'd wait maybe an hour or two later for your output to come out. And finally, you'd get some information about what was wrong with your computer program, okay? Ah, quite an interesting process, which has changed quite a bit over the years, I might say. Well, and so then, uh, here's a DEC PDP-8. Now, Tom, uh, this was a uh, DEC is Digital Equipment Corporation, and this is the actual manufacturer. Tom put up a picture, I don't know if you're, you probably remember, of a VAX-11. Well. Uh, uh, digital equipment made the VAX-11, but before they made the VAX-11, they made a couple of other mini computers. One was called this PDP-8. Okay, and here's a little picture. It's got all these little keys on the bottom, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the interesting thing to me, there were two interesting things to me about this machine. One was that uh, it was even more primitive than punch cards. It was a paper tape that you wrote your program on, okay? And the other interesting thing to me was when I took this course and actually programmed this machine, I was able to learn the entire computer architecture of the machine from start to finish, okay? There's no way you could do that with a modern mic microprocessor now, okay? Uh, and so, well, so before, uh, so I was also major in mathematics and I actually did a, um, an undergraduate research thesis on Hilbert's 10th problem, which kind of set me up for uh, getting interested in computational complexity. So now I'll move on here. And uh, so, well, I went to the Brown Archives and went to some website where uh, lots of pictures of, of, uni of buildings here at Brown are actually uh, available online. And uh, well, so the how this, this was the picture that reminded me the most of the house that, that, uh, the, that we were in when we formed this Department of Computer Science, okay? Uh, now, I don't think it's the exact picture. Tom actually had the exact picture. And yesterday I took a walk, and that building has changed. It's still there, but it's changed quite a bit. It's, uh, it's got some ungodly addition put onto, like somehow tacked onto it. I guess kind of like what Tom wants to do with this, the CIT and the science library, right? Okay, so, so here we are. Uh, uh, the program in computer science morphed into this department of computer science. And I, you know, I was right in the middle of this. I'm sitting there doing, taking courses and uh, doing my PhD work during this time, okay? And uh, so yeah, so here's, I dug through my archives and here's the memo that John wrote, okay? And, John, I took this memo and I framed it for you. Uh, not quite an endowed chair, but hopefully it will bring back some memories. Okay? 
And um, so this was very, very exciting, okay? Oops, I keep pushing the wrong button, oh, sorry. Okay, so here's the memo. Uh, and you can see that John mentions that uh, Don Knuth was gonna be coming to the university and being the keynote speaker. Well, uh, you can't imagine how exciting uh, myself and some of the other graduate students were at getting to actually meet and interact with Don Knuth. Uh, and then over on the right here is the actual program. Uh, I dug, again, I dug this out of my archives. Some people will call me a pack rat, and sometimes being a pack rat comes in handy, okay? Uh, and so uh, I'll mention one other story about this, okay? If you, if you look down here, the after dinner speaker was this extremely interesting fellow. His name was Vim Klein, and he, was na he, was, he called himself the human computer. Okay, and I remember being at this dinner, and after the dinner, it was just amazing what this guy could do. I think somebody asked him, you know, what is the cube root of like 247,522? And within a half a second, Vim Klein had the answer, and we sat there and verified the answer. It was amazing, okay? Uh, so let's move on here. Uh, so here's our VAX 11 that, that, you know, here's a, Tom had this picture. Uh, uh, another thing that came about in the, uh, when I was still a gra graduate student wrapping up my PhD was something called TheoryNet, which was really the predecessor of what we know as the internet today. There were a handful of universities that uh, once, once the, uh, the, the people that figured out, I think it was uh, Len Kleinrock and et cetera at UCLA, figured out how to make computers talk to each other, they hooked up a handful of universities on something called TheoryNet. And I would go into John's office and he'd be happily sitting there trading uh, the early version of emails with some of his colleagues at, say, MIT or uh, other universities, okay? And, okay, I'll also mention something called, does anybody know what a 1200 baud modem is? Well, I do, okay? Okay, so uh, here's a picture of one. This is what connected you to the internet. And so 1200 baud means 1,200 bits per second, okay? So, okay, so what is the baud rate that we current, I mean, our baud rate today is probably a, a gigabaud or something like this. I don't even know it's so, so much larger than this. But, okay, I'll, I'll mention that you can't imagine the excitement that myself and others had when uh, the makers of these modems actually increased the baud rate from 1,200 to 9,600 baud. Okay, eight times the speed going from one computer to another was just, uh, it was like lightning in a bottle. Okay, uh, so let's move on. So here's my PhD thesis, like I said. Uh, and I'll mention, um, uh, John and I published a paper at the uh, Symposium on the Theory of Computing back in 1980. The title was Graph Pebbling with Many Free Pebbles Can Be Difficult. And uh, so John took me out to Los Angeles, and we got there a day or two early, and who shows up but Larry Harper? <laughs> and Larry gives us a tour of Pasadena and takes us up way over the Rose Bowl, and I get this great view of the Rose Bowl. I'll never forget it. Thank you, Larry. Okay? Um, yeah, so these were, these were great times. I, I, I just love my time at Brown, and I, I you know, it's just memory, when I come back here, there's memories that come flooding back, and uh, I can't say enough about the university and what I've been able to take away from it. Okay, so, um, so here's where I, like, here's my tiny bit of research in this talk, okay? So uh, the research we did uh, in the, uh, the late 70s, early 80s, and shortly afterwards concentrated on trade-offs, oops, okay? Uh, so they were various things like, for example, time-space trade-offs, and, and John had a clever technique for doing this that we refer to as the pebble game. So we would, we would have a graph that represented a computation, and we would move pebbles around this graph, which represented, the pebbles represented the space, okay, and the number of moves you had to make to actually compute the outputs represented the time. So given that model, we were able to analyze a number of problems uh, in terms of their uh, space-time complexity. And then uh, we moved on to other things like, for example, in VLSI, we looked at area time trade-offs. Uh, we looked at circuit size versus circuit depth. Uh, our main 
focus was on lower bounds, trying to prove that no matter how you did something, it had, it had to be at least this bad, right? And of course, we were also interested in, in algorithms that could, that could actually satisfy the lower bound if we could find out what those algorithms were, okay? And so, for example, we would be able to prove results like this. We'd be able to prove that, say, for the Fourier transform, uh, the product of time and space has to be at least the square of the number of inputs to the problem, okay? And the same thing for convolution, which is uh, uh, a slightly more complex problem than the Fourier transform. And then in VLSI, when you went to VLSI, for example, the Fourier transform, no matter how you chose to realize the Fourier transform as a VLSI circuit, you were stuck with this, the area times the square of the time had to be at least the square of the number of inputs. Okay. And so uh, just a quick sketch of the proofs. The proofs are basically information theoretic. You take this graph uh, of the computation and you basically uh, split it in half and you look at the information flowing back and forth and no matter how you split this graph, there has to be so much information to get from one side to the other. Okay, so, um, so uh, you know, I, I got done pretty early at Brown, like I said, three, three plus years. So post 81, I'm gonna take you through a little tour of, of what I've been doing since then. Okay, so the first thing I did was I, I went off and I was a faculty member at the University of Massachusetts. And I had a couple of, uh, of uh, students of my own there that did some fairly interesting work. For example, I'll mention that uh, if you look at binary addition in VLSI, there's kind of an interesting phenomenon that goes on, okay? Uh, if you look at a minimum depth realization of a binary adder, it requires area at least square of the number of bits that you're trying to add together. But if you just allow yourself double that depth, then the area shrinks to quite a bit less than n squared. It goes all the way down to n log n. And actually, this, this student was able to show uh, a whole spectrum of trade-offs in between there that captured this behavior. And then there was another student I had tacked on hand who actually looked at how to realize these lower bounds as circuits. Okay, and then I went off from the University of Massachusetts and uh, uh, went to a place called the Supercomputing Research Center, which has been rebranded into what we currently call the Center for Computing Sciences, okay? And um, I'll mention this machine that when I showed up, shortly after I showed up, they had a Cray too, okay? Well, Cray, does anybody know about Cray? Cray is this, uh, this amazing architect named Seymour Cray that would just do magic with high-performance computers, okay? Well, so uh, Seymour Cray had been active and he had produced the Cray 1 and he had produced the Cray XMP, and this next Cray 2 was on the floor roughly 1986 or so when I got to the Supercomputing Research Center. And what an amazing machine this was. This machine had 256 megawords of memory. Oh my God, wow, all that memory, okay? Now I'll pull out my cell phone, and I, you know, what, how much memory do you think is on my cell phone? Right, there's probably at least eight gigabytes, right? Okay, just, not, well, but anyway, back in 1986, this was quite a breakthrough. And the other interesting thing about this machine was, not only did it have all this memory, it had 16,000 words of what they called fast local memory. So I went to work and I knew about some results relating to uh, trade-offs that could use this local memory and I wrote a whole bunch of programs to solve the FFT that would perform really fast by making use of this local memory, which you could think of as somewhat of a computer cache, except that a computer cache is actually hidden from the programmer. This local memory was explicitly available to the programmer, me being the programmer. Okay. And uh, so we've had some interesting machines in our building since then. I'll mention a couple of them. One was this connection machine 
that this fellow Danny Hillis from MIT developed and put together. Another was uh, uh, a couple of successor Cray machines, a Cray T3D and a Cray T3E. And I actually have uh, a circuit board from a Cray T3E. I'll, I'll pass it around. <laughs> you can take a look, OK? Well, so uh, essentially this, whoops, wrong button again. OK, this Cray T3E, this circuit board, uh, there would be a few thousand of these as nodes of a, of a, of a, of a high-performance computer. And our task was to mount problems, for example, the FFT and problems like that on this computer and solve them as fast as possible. And we were getting, we were getting into the range of teraflops when we were doing that. So I was, I was in this mode of, uh, of mapping algorithms to architectures. Uh, so I actually, it, it hasn't been all the way since 1981 since I've been back at Brown. I actually came back here in 1999 when they had a, a celebration. John was turning 60 and the department put together a, a, a one-day technical forum in his honor. And you'll see here, among other things, well, you know, here's Franco. He gave a talk. Uh, Chuck Fiducci actually came here. And that's why I say I know for sure if Chuck was still with us today that he would be here right now. Uh, and, and I had the pleasure not only of, of knowing Chuck as a, as a fellow student of John's, but John, uh, Chuck actually worked for uh, a number of years at the Center of Computing Science uh, right a couple offices down from me. Chuck was a great guy. Okay, and then uh, in 2009 to 2010, uh, my wife Louise and I had the pleasure of uh, seeing John at a, at a much more free, frequent uh, basis when he came down and spent his year doing cybersecurity at the U.S. State Department. And I actually invited him out to our site. He came out and gave a talk on a framework for coded computation. And uh, last night at dinner, he was telling uh, he was telling us a pretty interesting story about when he was there visiting about how one of the colleagues uh, approached him about some work he had done in the past. And I'll, I'll leave it to him. If you, if you want to know the story, ask John afterwards. I, I'll, that's his story, not mine. OK? Well, so since 2010, uh, you know, computer architectures have just grown by leaps and bounds. So I'll give you a, like, like a little sampling, a little smidgen of sampling of what I've been working with. Uh, one is this, uh, this wonderful machine, this, this cluster, this Cray XE6. Uh, it's, it's, it's really quite a machine, I can attest, okay? I've programmed it, I've solved problems on it. Uh, I've done petaflop computations on these machines, okay? Another is these NVIDIA GPUs. And OK, so, uh, so I'll mention that. Well, what really has driven the GPU uh, revolution uh, up until the last few years was really computer gaming. So thank you, all of you out there that love to play computer games. Because us people uh, on, the, on the defense side of things that have to solve our crypt problems, well, you're the ones really driving the architecture, but we're taking those architectures and we're sure putting them to good use, let me tell you, okay? Uh, and along with that, you know, I've, I've, I've mostly stayed with the C programming language, but I'm also moving into the, this other Python type uh, uh, environment that, that the, the, it seems like you better get on the ban Python bandwagon, otherwise you're gonna get left behind, okay? so. Um, just a couple more slides here. Uh, so post-2010, I just wanted to mention this, this, this other machine called the Data Vortex. Uh, Coke Reed spent some time at the, uh, at the Center for Computer Science. He's a great guy. He ended up putting together, uh, uh, had, a, had a really neat idea on how to, um, how to network things with optics uh, and this has finally come to fruition in this machine called the Data Vortex. So Coke Reed actually has a company out there. You can go look at it. It's quite an interesting machine. And we have one in our basement, and we're trying to see what we can do with it. And uh, 
One other machine I'll mention. I have one other thing to pass out. This machine is uh, this is a this is a, a little node from this machine. It's the machine name is called Freightliner. But the interesting thing about this machine, it's what they call processor in memory. And there were a couple other people at the place I work for that pioneered this concept. And essentially, uh, think of it as taking a memory chip and just giving it enough processing power to do some interesting things, and then replicating this thousands and thousands of times to getting an, get an interesting architecture out of this, and then use it to solve interesting problems. So I'll pass this around too, and you can take a look. And then I'll just wrap up by saying that uh, my current interests are still trade-offs, uh, mapping algorithms to architecture, and recently I've gotten into this crazy field called machine learning that I won't really talk about at all, but I think we all know about it, and uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you.